Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the Collagen 6 and Collagen 12 Care Breakout, uh, the last breakout grouping of the day. Before we get started introducing our panelists and getting to your questions, I have a brief disclaimer to read. Uh, the information and opinions shared by our panelists will be generalized statements and are not intended to be interpreted as medical consultation or substitution for medical care. Please consult your local healthcare providers regarding any specific health related concerns. This session is being recorded and will be shared on our public YouTube channel after the conference portal closes on August 31st and will also be available within this portal in the next few days. Okay, now we're gonna introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Haliglo, I am so bad at pronouncing your last name. Can you tell me how to pronounce your name and introduce yourself, Kochner? Should be able to. Oh, there you okay. go. Thank you. This is Gökner Hadilov. I am happy. Okay. Uh, this is Gökner Hadilov. I am a pediatric neurologist at Hajati Children's Hospital, uh, Ankara, Turkey. Thank you, Rachel. Great. Thank you, Dr. Foley. Hi, I'm Reagan Foley. I'm a pediatric neurologist, neuromuscular specialist working at the National Institutes of Health. And Dr. Butterfield. I'm Russ Butterfield. I'm a pediatric neurologist at the University of Utah, um, where I direct the neuromuscular clinics and uh, the neuromuscular research program. Dr. Pasco. Hi, I'm John Pasco. I'm at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and I'm a pediatric pulmonologist and sleep physician. And Dr. Bonneman. Hey, I'm Karsten Bonneman. I'm a pediatric neurologist at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C. Thank you. So um, to get us started, um, I'd first like to talk about kind of the, the plenary session this morning talked about clinical trial readiness, and I would like to get kind of a brief statement from a couple of you about how that specifically applies to collagen 6 and collagen 12. Um, Dr. Bonham, did you want to start? Yeah, so we, we are um, in, uh, I should say, pretty good shape for, for collagen 6, um, because as uh, Dr. Foley was presenting this morning, we have a natural history study. Um, that uh, we did at the um, NIH over uh, four years with, uh, in collaboration with QCMD uh, that really established outcome measures for the uh, age group of the children greater than five years of age. Uh, and uh, that puts us in, a, in already in the tri readiness category. And as a matter of fact, we've already test driven it in the Omega phase one study at the NIH. Uh, what we're working at uh, at the moment to really get us uh, try ready, if you will, across the ages, is to uh, establish outcome measures um, and uh, natural history feasibility data uh, from the very young children from zero to five uh, to be able to um, establish uh, clinical trial readiness there as well. And we do that um, with traditional outcome measures, but we also add, of course, uh, exploratory outcome measures that Dr. Forty was mentioning this uh, morning. So we. I think we're in good shape um, for clinical trial readiness. Great. Anybody have anything to add to that? No, nope, we're good. All righty. So I'd like to talk about uh, dietary supplements. Um, that could be anything from collagen supplements, um, a word I can't pronounce that starts with P-T-R-O. I think you guys can help me with that. <laughs> um, have they shown um, any kind of ability to positively impact muscle strength or functionality? Dr. Foley, let's start with you. So yes, um, so terostilbene, I think is the question that was posted by one of the families. And we actually uh, reviewed that data in detail in our team uh, during our lab meeting. And it is a study that came out of Italy looking at a compound, uh, which is actually um, naturally occurring in blueberries, for example. So, and the study looked at um, that compound and inspect on a cellular level uh, to uh, kind of to, um, uh, really moderate uh, to modulate autophagy, which is kind of the, the, the cell's ability to process um, uh, compounds in the cell that need to be excreted. But in summary, the data so far as, as a whole looks at the cellular level and the data did not look at the level of a translation to the function, like for example, in a mouse model. So we don't have enough data to say that this compound, the terostilbene, uh, should be started because we don't have enough data is pointing towards um, effectiveness. Um, I don't know, Dr. Bottom, if you want to comment further on that. Well, it shouldn't, shouldn't prevent you from eating plenty of blueberries and almonds because <laughs> that's why you have it. But um, 
Uh, so it's a, it's a natural compound, as Dr. Foley was um, saying, and the idea would be to kind of uh, make autophagy in the cells a bit more efficient. And the um, idea would be that autophagy in the cells is uh, backed up in collagen 6, and there's data for that. And so um, the idea would be whether that could help the uh, autophagy flux, and there's data in that paper to support that. Um, but it's uh, it's unclear yet, and we need more data, it's unclear yet how that translates to function, and also what the dose equivalent would be that the mice have been getting to the human. I, yesterday, I just did a back on the envelope. Of course, mice and human dosages are hard to compare, but the mice were getting 90 milligrams per kilogram body weight, I believe, which in a in a 30 kilogram child would be um, one bottle of pills per day um, that you get in the mice, which uh, so it's a lot of pills to swallow to get to that dose. Um, so there's some uh, work to do, but uh, I do in encourage blueberry yogurt for sure. <laughs> Excellent. And then what about collagen, taking collagen supplements? Does that have any kind of impact uh, on these disorders? Um, no, the, um, the uh, collagen, there, there's lots of collagen supplements out there, you know, topical and to, to be eaten, but collagens are really a huge family of things um, out there in nature and their particular um, protein that have what we call a collagen domain of which collagen 6 is just one and an atypical one for that matter. Uh, and the collagens, when you eat them, are broken down by the gut and the um, and broken down and put, put taken apart basically into the amino acid component and the body would have then put it back together to a collagen which doesn't work in collagen 6 disease because that's where the defect is. In other words, no, uh, eating collagen supplements will not, will not help. And healthy nutrition, healthy and balanced nutrition, of course, will. Great. Okay. Anybody else have anything to add on supplements? <clears throat> Just one comment. Um, I think Carson even mentioned this in the other meeting, but vitamin D I think is an important supplement to make sure we're following in all patients with neuromuscular disease. And um, so, so beyond that though, I don't think there's anything. Uh, so along with vitamin D would be calcium yeah, and maybe potassium to help the uptake, right? Sure. Okay, okay, great. <clears throat> so moving on. Um, I have a question about the increase in cell death as well as the slow absent cell repair and that exercise that builds muscle by breaking down muscle um, is not necessarily uh, ideal in neuromuscular conditions. Um, so does exercising too much have the potential to be detrimental? Um, and so for instance, like bike riding or weightlifting or swimming, like there's lots, lots of different kinds of exercises, right? So what are, what are some bad forms or things that we shouldn't be doing and what are some good forms and how much would we say is too much? Dr. Foley, it looks like you are ready to talk about this. Sure, I don't want to overstep though. I don't know if Dr. Butterfield <laughs> want to start or. Yeah. Uh, we'll probably say the same thing. <laughs> right, so I'll start, you can, jump, you can jump in. <laughs> I mean, think bicycling on a non-inclined surface. So on a flat surface is fine. It's good for conditioning the muscle. It's not going to break down muscles, but hills, um, are not a great idea. Um, and likewise, like for example, often comes to us a question about weightlifting. You know, when you bring that dumbbell up and you flex your your um, you flex your biceps, that, that's not a problem. But but that's when you actually extend the arm that you can break down muscle. So we we recommend against weightlifting. We recommend bicycling on a flat surface. You recommend swimming, excellent form of exercise that would not over you know, uh, stress or harm the muscle. So there are many forms of conditioning that are good for promoting the muscle without causing damage. And I, th I think I would only add to that, um, just to recognize the importance of good recreation and being out and being together as families and people. And swimming is a really great way you can do that because families can do it all together. Um, and there are adaptive recreation programs out there in near communities. Uh, we're working more and more with uh, some programs here in Utah to, to facilitate interactions and doing things. And for example, with bike riding, um, they've now developed e-assist bikes, which can take some of the pressure off of riding just only on an incline and, and do some of the work for you, but still allow you to be out and, and doing things. So uh, in a sense, you know, these aggressive recre exercise programs aren't good, but Boy, being out there and doing things together, um, you know, recreation is really great. Dr. Pasco, do you want to comment on that from a respiratory standpoint? Yeah, definitely. I would 
have really nothing further to add as far as what's already been said. I um, totally agree. You don't want to be too aggressive. Um, one thing we think about from the pulmonary standpoint is also the chest wall. And so taking a big deep breath and really expanding the rib cage is important too in terms of trying to maintain the chest wall shape. And so uh, one way to do that, I don't think anybody has gills. So you take a big deep breath before you go underwater uh, and swim underwater. So I routinely, if patients and kids like to go underwater, absolutely, that's a fantastic form of exercise. Uh, and just over, in terms of uh, just overall uh, well-being, I think what Dr. Butterfield was saying is super important as well. Great. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can add to that. The, um... Exercise is, in, in principle, it's a good thing. And uh, I think exercise in neuromuscular disease has a bad reputation, um, but it has an unjustifiably bad uh, reputation. So I think um, the, the downside of not moving really uh, completely outweighs the, uh, any risk of, of exercise. And uh, exercise is, um, is really good, good in neuromuscular disease, except for the extremes of exercise that breaks down your muscle, this eccentric type exercise that weightlifters try to do to build their muscles. But you know, the cardiovascular type exercise, even moderate weightlifting that doesn't break your muscle, all of that, uh, probably the benefits outweigh uh, um, the risk for that. Also remember that uh, patients with a neuromuscular disease are inherently limited, of course, from the excessive forms of exercise by their muscle weakness. Um, so there's good work out of Denmark um, to say that even in a muscular dystrophy that's more fragile in the muscle than collagen six, uh, it's uh, it's still beneficial, so I do encourage um, that as part of it. And it, it really, we have some anecdotal evidence, and Dr. Pasco probably as well, that it also positively impacts uh, pulmonary health. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, Dr. Halilglu, I'm going to uh, direct this question to you first. Um, a question came in about a, a child with mild symptoms and um, early onset, but mild symptoms and kind of trying to get a grasp and understanding of what does that do mild symptoms early mean being prepared for more severe disease down the road or do we have any idea of kind of what what that future could look like if we have mild symptoms to start with actually that's a really great pleasure to answer this question in the presence of this great team my esteemed colleagues uh, already made a very uh, great contribution to the field in terms of understanding the uh, early milestones and the correlation of the uh, phenotypes within the collagen six related vascular dystrophy. That was a combined effort uh, from uh, NIH group and the uh, Spain. Uh, so looking at the motor milestones uh, that are gained in the early period, uh, in the early years of life, uh, will that correlate with, uh, for instance, long-term uh, uh, loss of ablation or some of the other measures such as pulmonary function testing? So uh, the, as I understand this gained or uh, to just a stand for steps without, uh, you know, not using a rating system. That is a, 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 a pretty good, uh, a, 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 maybe a, a, just a prognostic, you know, from, from a prognostic point of view that they have. So I think as more knowledge uh, accumulates in terms of uh, natural history studies and looking at this uh, functional uh, uh, evolution of the symptoms uh, within different age groups, uh, we will better understand uh, uh, to uh, uh, subdivide the collagen six related uh, dystrophies into subgroups and maybe uh, have proactive uh, also management according to the subtype beginning from the very early age. Great. Dr. Foley, did you have something to add? Sure. So that was a, a lovely um, acknowledgement of our work. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nair. So, so we had done a collaboration. It was actually the, the idea of our collaborators in Barcelona, because many families ask early on, how do I, is there a probabilistic approach to determine the future motor and pulmonary function? And we had done a retrospective study looking at the data of maximal early motor milestones and how it may predict or you know, correlate with the ultimate or future motor and pulmonary function. And it seems to be the case, at least so far from what we studied, that 
if um, a child can attain the ability to arise from the floor without using furniture, without holding onto another person, of course they could use their own legs, but if they can arise from the floor in the middle of a room without assistance that that child likely, um, if that's their maximum motor milestone, that child will likely um, ultimately have a phenotype or a clinical picture more similar to intermediate phenotype, whereas those that are able to um, climb stairs out the railing more likely would be Bethlehem. Again, it's all probability. Um, and those patients that need to use assistance of furniture or someone else to get off the floor more likely ultimately be a clinical phenotype of Ulrich congenital muscular dystrophy. But again, we still need to confirm all this in future studies, but it seems like there is a way to look at the early motor milestones to try to, in a probabilistic way, predict the future function. Does that sound right, Dr. Bonneman? Great, anybody else have anything to add? No, we're good? Okay, um, let's talk about some kind of alternative treatments that are out there. Um, stem cell therapy treatments and Botox to be specific. Um, I know everybody probably here has a very strong opinion on that and I think we should we should share that with the audience. So Dr. Bonneman, do you like to, to talk about both of those? Sure. Um, so uh, Botox uh, is of course a, a treatment that is um, meant to inactivate muscle function. That, um, so that's at the outset, that's how Botox works. It basically paralyzes um, the nerve talking to the muscle and then the muscle is weaker because of that. So that inherently, if you, if you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense for a neuromuscular disorder where you have weakness at baseline already. Of course, um, the idea of Botox comes from the treatment of contractures. Um, but the treatment of contractures for Botox are very special contractures. Those are contractures that are caused by hyperactivity of the muscle in something that we call spasticity. So when you have, for instance, a brain lesion or a spinal cord lesion at birth, your muscles are constantly in overdrive. They're overactive. They cause the muscle uh, to be contracted all the time. That's where Botox makes sense. Um, however, in collagen 6 disorders, the contracture is because of an abnormal connective tissue on top of a weak muscle. So there, Botox does not make sense. Uh, so it's not a treatment uh, for contractures in collagen 6 disorders. For the stem cell therapy, uh, the, um, there is evidence, uh, again, from mouse work um, uh, that, that points the way that they, if, if one were able to distribute stem cells efficiently, into all muscles, if that was possible, uh, of, of a particular kind of stem cell that likes to be um, the cell of origin for collagen 6, or so called mesenchymal stem cells, uh, then when they are put uh, into the place in the muscle, they'll be able to um, produce collagen 6. So it's a similar proof of principle like we had with the pterostilbe before. They point the right direction, um, but it's not quite yet um, translatable. The problem is that if you uh, inject stem cells at any quantity, they would not be uh, uh, able to saturate the muscle to the degree that you need to correct the collagen 6 deficiency in all muscles. Um, so it is probably a better way to try to coax the stem cells that are there uh, in the muscle um, that, are, they, they, that are at the moment dysfunctional to make collagen, to make them functional, to make the collagen again. Uh, that's what we discussed uh, yesterday in the toolbox ses uh, uh, session, where you can do genetic uh, therapies to use the stem cell population that is there, correct them to be able to make collagen 6 and let them do their work. Uh, that would be probably more translatable then hoping that you can distribute uh, stem cells that are donor stem cells across the entire body to correct the deficiency. Okay, great. Does anybody have anything else to add to that? We're good. All right, thank you for covering those. Um, let's switch uh, quickly uh, to collagen 12. We have a couple of questions um, regarding collagen 12 um, in terms of recessive mutations and how do those compare um, in symptoms to recessive collagen 6. And then with the kids with call 12 mutations, will they lose their ability to walk? Do we know? So for me, I guess. <laughs> um, so the um, collagen 12 uh, comes in, just like collagen 6, it comes in, in two general flavors, if I may use that term, which is loss of function and dominant mutations. And the loss of function recessive mutation where no collagen 12 is being made, are invariably more severe 
uh, than the dominant mutations that in contrast to collagen six um, tend to be quite a, a bit milder. So in the recessive complete loss of function, um, these children are um, very hypotonic. They have very low muscle tone uh, and also um, not a whole lot of muscle strength, even though the muscle is probably better preserved uh, than in a collagen six disorder, but the connective tissue is really more abnormal than in a collagen six disorder. And because that's the case, um, the muscles, even if they try to pull at a tendon, can't really do it because the tendon is so uh, floppy, if you will. So these children are um, more bendable everywhere compared to collagen six children who, as you know, have a combination of bendiness and contractures. The collagen 12 children usually have um, floppiness uh, and uh, uh, everywhere to the degree that they, they have difficulty to stand, support their weight and, and walk. Um, so children with complete collagen 12 deficiency do not um, uh, to typically achieve the ability to walk. Having said that, we now know of collagen 12 recessive children um, where one of the two mutations is less severe so that some collagen 12 is being made and those children do better, including uh, achieving the ability to walk. It is our impression, particularly um, from, from the recessive, but also from looking at the dominant uh, patient that um, it tends actually to be fortunately not as progressive. It actually has a tendency to improve somewhat over time. Uh, so that in contrast of collagen 12, probably uh, collagen 6, probably collagen 12 does not show the progressiveness that collagen 6 uh, shows. So um, once you are ambulant with collagen 12, the hope is that that um, will be maintained uh, in, to a longer degree. Although we don't have, this is rare and uh, early days, we don't have all the data to show that conclusively, um, but this is our impression at the moment. Great, thanks. I think we have we have a long way to go to uh, to better understand that subtype. So let's switch to pulmonary. Um, Dr. Pasco, can you talk about kind of the the key areas in collagen six and collagen twelve, um, probably similar um, that that we need to pay attention to? And um, can you talk about the um, daily use of cough assist in, in terms of maintaining chest wall compliance? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of, I guess the approach I'll take is just sort of exactly what you're saying, the very general approach, the, the various facets of sort of pulmonary care and collagen 6 and, and collagen 12. So to start um, thinking about airway clearance, um, when we say that augmenting your ability to cough, um, I think it's really important to denote that or to distinguish that the secretions in the airway really shouldn't be any different than normal. And so um, they should be able to mobilize reasonably easily unless um, somebody is sick. And so some may uh, be prescribed like a chest vest or something to shake up the chest wall and try to mobilize secretions. But, um, but truly the, the, the issue at hand is trying to get the secretions out. So when you take a, when you cough, you take a big deep breath first and you get to your total lung capacity or as best you can. And then you close your vocal cords and then you burst and, you, and your secretions come up. And so that's what we need to mimic in order to get an adequate cough. And so um, VEST is just gonna shake. I, what I tell my patients is you can shake, rattle and roll all you want, but you have to get your, your secretions up and out of your airway. So really, truly um, the mainstay is cough assist. I very, very, very rarely have a VEST unless it's sort of an anecdotal um, was attempted inpatient and worked. So um, just to mention that. Uh, the other thing is if secretions do get thicker, then you can start thinking about how to thin them. And of course, and hydration is key um, to making sure. So overall body hydration can help, but then also like normal saline nebulizers, potentially hypertonic uh, nebulizer as well, which is sort of like condensed salt water in the airway to help try to pull some water in, into the airway. Um, to mobilize secretions. Um, along the indication to start cough assist really is, um, you know, if, if your um, child's having recurrent infections that, and more so infections that it takes a long time to recover, especially if they turn into pneumonias, um, or it's, um, you notice that they're just having a hard time clearing their airway, that may be a sign, would be a sign that cough assist may be indicated. And then, um, or pulmonary function testing can also help. But for some, you know, you may be getting a 
cough assist machine before pulmonary function testing is feasible. Since it is a difficult test to do, many a decent proportion of adults cannot do it. So to act, uh, to ask a young child with muscle weakness to do it is, you can imagine it, it's even harder. Um, and so you don't always have those numbers, those objective numbers to go off of for um, insurance purposes too. So sometimes it's sort of the clinical um, scenario there. Um, the benefits to cough assist can keep you out of the hospital definitely. Um, I usually will have patients do it once in the morning and then maybe once in the evening. If you think about it overnight, your secretions, you take shallower breaths, your secretions may sort of build up. And so to really get up and moving and start the day with a clean airway, you can um, use cough assist. And sort of same thing before bed at nighttime to try to clear the airways. Um, the Bennett, one of the other things that um, sort of killing two birds with one stone, you can clear the airways and then you also move the chest wall. And so part of the issue um, with um, collagen six and um, potentially collagen 12 too would be, we know contractures. And so you think about your ribs and your vertebrae as joints. Um, and so you need to mobilize those joints and keep them flexible. If you're not taking big deep breaths routinely, they can really get socked in. And the analogy I, I draw is if you break your arm, you're in a cast for a while. If you get your cast off and then it can be pretty tough to try to move your arm again. So same thing, you need to take some big deep breaths. And when you're, if you um, ha have muscle weakness, then it could be hard to get a deep enough breath in order to really mobilize. And so that's where the, the cough assists um, can also help with that since it's applying a positive pressure. Um, the, there are various types of cough assist machines. Um, I think Hillarm has the vital cough and then um, uh, the cough assist um, by I want to say Respironics or ResMed is the one we commonly use. The nice part is that there are multiple modes. I say that because you can, you can do a hyperinflation mode where it's only a positive pressure in. So cough assist is going to do the positive pressure in to reach total lung capacity and then rapidly suck out. And it's a longer inhale. If you think about it, when you take a big deep breath, it's a longer inhale and then the blast out. And so um, with, with hyperinflation, it's only the positive pressure in. There's no negative pressure suctioning. And, and the idea is to stretch. And so the longer pressure in might also be a little bit longer inhalation time. Um, we had a study uh, published uh, a couple of years ago now, I think, where in, in kids with um, LAMA2 and more sort of Ulrich phenotype of collagen 6 who had a baseline FEC that was sort of in the moderate to severe restrictive lung disease range. And the ages, average age was 10, but as young as five. And so you have to think about how fast the child breathes as well in terms of what sort of inhalation time to use for hyperinflation. In that study, we used three seconds to really sort of open up and, and hold. The next thing to mention is um, what pressure is needed. And the important thing is you're moving the chest wall really, but I think the interesting thing that we found too is it actually doesn't take a whole lot of pressure to move the chest wall. Um, you don't need to blow someone out of the water with pressures of 50 and 60. We, we were, um, we would increase pressures until there was a less than 10% change in the volume that was achieved. And we found on average, it was around 20 or 25, um, which is considerably lower than what a lot of patients might be on. Um, and that it's sufficient. Um, I think that we're learning more about hyperinflation, I think, and sort of anecdotally, I feel like we can change the shape of a chest wall or more so maintain the shape of a chest wall if you are if you get it instituted earlier. Um, sort of segueing into when it's, when it's a little more difficult to change is scoliosis. And so if you think about scoliosis is an important part of pulmonary care too, the sense that with, with the curvature, the ribs can shape, change shape. And so as the ribs change shape, they're gonna be less able to, they'll move less easily and move your chest wall less easily as well. And so it's really, really important um, to keep a close eye on scoliosis and perhaps intervene before the ribs have really um, uh, been, been distorted. Um, going in terms of, um, I guess the next thing we could talk about would be maybe uh, a sweep from that standpoint too. 
um, which is really, really, really important too um, and from the pulmonary perspective because with, so with collagen six, we know the diaphragm is predominantly affected. When we breathe in, majority of our inspiratory effort is from our diaphragm. There are muscles between your ribs called intercostals that can contribute some, but that's gonna be more so in times of stress. Um, and so if you have a, diaph a weak diaphragm, you actually may be walking around. Um, there are some um, with collagen six muscular dystrophy who are ambulatory and they have higher carbon dioxide levels during the day. You wouldn't otherwise expect it unless you look. Um, it's one of those sort of nuances of collagen six. Um, from, in terms of talking about diaphragm strength. So when you enter sleep, we're a little bit less sensitive to carbon dioxide levels and oxygen levels as well to change our, our breathing efforts. Um, the important distinction with sleep is dream sleep versus not dream sleep. In dream sleep, we lose muscle tone and our, our um, breathing, it's sort of, it's always on automatic pilot, but it's, it's on automatic pilot um, during dream sleep, but it's on automatic pilot with emphasis on the diaphragm because you're losing um, the muscle input from the rest of the chest wall. And so if you have a weaker diaphragm, you actually start off having disturbances in sleep more so during dream sleep. Um, and you might not hear snoring. Um, if you have a weak, if you think about it, to generate a snore, you have to have enough negative pressure in your chest to sort of suck in your upper airway and cause that vibration. And so just because there's no snore doesn't mean that this, this, um, there's not something going on with breathing during sleep. And what will tip you off that there is, is that your child might start waking up a lot more at nighttime um, and not just for, Dr. Foley had mentioned it earlier, maybe not necessarily just for um, turning and repositioning, getting comfortable. Or if you feel like it's getting a little excessive for turning and repositioning, it might actually be that your child woke up because of a breathing issue. Um, the other, uh, so that's one of the, the primary questions I ask is how many times is your child waking up at night? Or is your um, child waking up with a headache in the morning? If you have high carbon dioxide levels, higher carbon dioxide levels in the morning, you'll have a headache and then you can blow it off um, when you wake up as your wake drive kicks in and the headache will go away. Um, you may notice some increase in daytime behavior issues um, out of proportion to the age of your child. Um, that can be another sign of untreated sleep disorder breathing as well. And so, tip, so the advice is um, once you have a diagnosis of collagen six um, muscular dystrophy, it's, you really should probably have a sleep study right off the bat just to make sure that everything looks good sleep-wise. And then the name of the game is gonna be lots of sleep studies down the road just to make sure everything is all right. It's, um, and especially more so with the Ulrich and, and um, intermediate phenotypes. Um, we will, it's to discuss sleep studies, it's really important um, in children to monitor carbon dioxide levels. Many adult labs, it's not standard by any means. And so it's, um, it, and unfortunately, pediatric labs aren't necessarily all over. Some adult labs will have a carbon dioxide monitor, but it's not big enough for the, or not small enough for the child. And so that's an important thing to ask. The other thing is how the sleep study is read. We have specific criteria for um, hypoventilation from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, but that was really developed more from the adult standpoint and not patients with neuromuscular disorders. And so there's um, many of the sort of consensus, uh, consensus statements from the pulmonary perspective for um, children with neuromuscular disorders uses a diff little different um, guideline for defining hypoventilation. Um, some will, it, it can first show up in dream sleep as I'm talking, as I mentioned, and it may be that the, um, the carbon dioxide level is just above normal, but the child is breathing pretty fast to try to maintain that. So it's sort of like what the analogy I draw is sort of compensated shock. Your body is making up for it until trying to keep your blood pressure until it, until it can't anymore. And so that to me is sort of early signs of hypoventilation and potentially a reason to start um, bi-level PAP therapy. Um, it's not uncommon that during that time as well, you're gonna see some daytime symptoms as well or that frequent nighttime awakening too. Um, 
As far as the modality of bi-level PAP, it's bi-level first and foremost. Um, it's, it's not uncommon that we hear, um, you know, I was diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, plus or minus the hypoventilation, and we were prescribed a CPAP. And CPAP just is, stands for continuous positive airway pressure, continuous being that there's one pressure. Bi-level means that there's a pressure going in to help you breathe in, and a base pressure to just sort of maintain the airway open. Um, and the, the other important thing is to have a backup rate attached to it as well. As kids get weaker, the, they may have difficulty triggering the ventilator or the bi-level bi machine. And so you wanna be able to have a rate for them to fall back on to really help them rest at night. So when, once the general rule of thumb is once sleep disorder breathing is established, in uh, children with collagen six, then we talk about BiPAP and not CPAP. Um, if for um, just to mention surgical procedure for OSA, in pediatrics, the standard of care for OSA is tonsils and adenoids. They got to come out um, if they're present. And I are, I think it's something to consider potentially, but it also is sort of the full clinical picture of the child. And if you have muscle weakness, then potentially taking your tonsils and adenoids out. It may, they may actually help you stenting open the airway sometimes. And so when you remove them, it actually, and this isn't necessarily across the board that you remove them and the airway becomes more floppy. Sometimes it, it occurs where it actually helps that you can lower the pressures, but it's just something that's important to think about um, um, with some serious thought, whether a, a tonsils and adenoids would help to um, uh, treat the sleep apnea. The, in general, the rule of thumb is to use positive airway pressure, though, um, for treating any sort of sleep disorder breathing. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? We have one question about sleeping yeah. at an incline. Is that helpful? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question and a very important point. Um, I wish I could say that was a plug, but it wasn't. <laughs> so when you're laying, when you're laying flat, your let's switch it, when you're sitting upright like we are currently, your insides, your intestines and everything, gravity pulls them down, which pulls your diaphragm down and therefore increases the, the amount of air that's in your chest wall and your lungs. When you lay flat, gravity doesn't work in your favor and your intestines, your stomach and everything pushes up on the diaphragm. And so that's extra force that your diaphragm has to go um, against in order to get a good deep breath. So Truly sleep in kids with collagen six or kids in neuromuscular disease, it's actually a state of potential stress and not a state of relaxation until you adequately um, uh, treat them if one is indicated. Great, thank you. Yeah, oh, sorry, one more really important point. Yeah. Um, uh, the, in terms of the interface for using, um, for PAP therapy, the important thing is we have to be cognizant of if what if what if a patient vomits overnight and you have a full face mask on with BiPAP, there's a risk of aspiration, especially if you're not strong enough to be able to remove the mask. And so our the rule of thumb is to use a nasal interface, a nasal only interface. Um, so it could be any really any form. We have no preference, whatever is tolerable. Um, as we know that it, it can be difficult to have kids wearing it, but oftentimes you'll be surprised that they'll realize, hey, I'm sleeping well now, I'm well rested. And so they actually end up sleep um, w readily wearing the, the BiPAP mask. But um, just wanted to mention, it's very, very important. Try to do nasal mask only. Yeah. So we have one question um, regarding a 25 year old affected, I believe he's probably Ulrich phenotype. Um, if CO2 levels appear normal, but still getting headaches um, when you wake up or even during the night, is there, what else could we be looking at to figure out the source of those headaches? Um, one thing, if we, if you feel like the sleep is optimized and um, the, the bi-level pressures are okay, saying that the CO2 is fine, most likely it is. Um, then you can think about other reasons for it um, being are you, like dehydration, fluid status, things of um, things like that. Um, it's the other. So while CO2 levels might look okay, sometimes it, it could also be that 
um, maybe the pressure is not quite enough and they're, they're still breathing really fast. And so 25 years old, so if I'm not seeing a respiratory rate, maybe in the teens, or, and depending on the shape of the chest wall as well, um, if, if, if you, perhaps it could be that the pressure looks like it's okay, the CO2 is all right, but he or she may be breathing, I'm gonna exaggerate, 40 times a minute. And that would tell you, maybe these pressures aren't quite right. And maybe we need to actually increase. And then you would see that the respiratory rate comes down. And that's something we're on a sleep study. It doesn't readily translate on reports. And when we read it, you sort of have to have that almost neuromuscular mindset um, when going into a study. And uh, so it's, it's uh, I, I always advocate for um, my patients when they come from afar and they're getting a study at home, I try to mention like, hey, please pay attention to end carbon dioxide levels and the respiratory rates, because that's, that's paramount. And that those pressures, are, you're being specifically talking about um, potentially increasing the IPAP setting, right? Not, to, not necessarily the EPAP. Correct. Yeah. Typically, it's the IPAP setting and not necessarily the EPAP. Um, the EPAP is sort of that lower baseline pressure, which you could almost think of as usually a pressure that's similar to CPAP or that continuous pressure. Um, that's more to keep the airway open. And if you get too high, it can become hard to exhale against it. And so usually it's more of a name. The name of the game is more IPAP. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Foley, I know you've been done, done a lot of work on this as well. Did you have anything to add? <clears throat> Just going to say, um, I'm hoping that the field has gotten to the point where getting the cough assist is not difficult for our patients because we kind of uniformly tell all of them to go for it um, as soon as they're able to uh, use it as proactive means for chest wall expansion at a young age in the like inspiratory mode. So hopefully that's, that's not hard to get. And, and um, I think also the benefit of knowing the natural history, we kind of know when we, we we need to be on that BiPAP. We're trying to be ahead of that curve. And so if we follow the forest vital capacity and we see that's kind of decreasing towards 50%, we want to be on the non-invasive ventilation in the form of BiPAP before our forest vital capacity is 50%. And so, and that's usually around age 10 years for the Ulrich patients and teenagers for the intermediate. But you're right. I mean, so the gold standard is sleep study. Sometimes people have difficulty getting that repeat sleep study done. And I think the repeat sleep study is so important for optimizing those pressures. And our adults in their 20s and 30s are in really high pressures. So, I mean, I, I, most of our adults have told us, you know, 20, 28, 26, 28 for inspired trade pressure, pretty high. Pretty high. Um, so I think getting those repeat studies to confirm and optimize pressures is going to be you know, key um, and hopefully getting a good interpretation. We see all the time that we get a sleep study facts and it's obstructive sleep apnea when we know the hypopneas or apneas are because of the diaphragm so weak. And so I think having that knowledge of the natural history is really key in directing the care. Also good. I think um, um, your, your point that you don't have to go crazy on the insufflation pressures to expand the ribcage is important because there's evidence that uh, collagen 6 may be more prone to pneumothorax uh, at excessive pressures. And so that's a good good point. For the, the cough assist, exactly. Really big, good point for the cough assist. People often ask us for the cough assist pressures. And so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Dr. Pesco, because that's a really important point is that we do see yeah, if it's too high, it, it could promote, promote pneumothorax. But for the BiPAP pressure, those can obviously be quite high and tolerate. But for the CPAP, I'm sorry, that for the cough assist, um, you said 20 to 25. Yeah, right. So I would say that's what we found in the study. In in clinic, I would say we often end up somewhere around 20 to 30. I sort of I aim a little on the lower end, knowing what we've seen. And it's more about how long you're holding that pressure and expanding the chest wall is what's really important. And obviously it shouldn't hurt. Yeah. Your child should not be scared to death when you do this. So <laughs> just gently increase and, and see what their tolerance is. And, right? they, and yeah, definitely. And one other point in terms of airway clearance that um, in terms of exercise, going back just a little bit is Exercise is a great form of airway clearance as well because you're getting bigger breaths. So to move mucus um, in, your, in your lungs, and we all have some snot in our lungs, it's, it's a fact of life. Uh, you have to get air behind it in order to move it out. So when you're exercising and you're taking the bigger breaths, you're helping your airway clearance that way too, in a natural way. Great. So would you consider, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say singing is another great way to do yes. that. I've had yeah. patients, just had a patient graduate from a theater program, a Duchenne patient, but 
with a very low FVC maintain his respiratory function just by singing a lot. Fantastic. Nice. I know lots of our kiddos love to sing. Um, would you consider an 11% decrease from year to year for a teenager out of extraordinary, or is that perhaps typical for that age? That I would say, and I, I know based on the natural history study, I think that was out. That would, to me, sounds like it might be a little high um, for the year to year. Um, okay. And I think Dr. Foley and Dr. Bonneman could provide truly exact numbers. I want to say it was around for Ulrich around like 2.6 to 3%. And then for intermediate type, it was just over 1% per year. Um, but that so can change based, the, based if grow, growing, right? If there's a growth spurt or, or something to that effect, could there be different. Are there are multiple factors that go into it. So when you do a pulmonary function test, you are compared against others, other, uh, your, your sex, you know, signed at birth, and then your height, your race, and your age. And so all of those, as those variables change, the reference values change. Um, but saying that, the, the numbers that I quoted there, that was taken into account the like percent reference in comparison to that normalized data set. And so you're absolutely right. It can, it's gonna change from year to year as kids grow, but we have sort of that standardized data set that we can look at as well. And we have the data between age five and 15 for Ulrich John Lester's to be 3.5% per year, but that's also based off of accurate measurements of height. So if it, one of those pulmonary function tests, the height was not accurately measured, then, the, then all the, the data is gonna be a bit off, but we never would expect that much of a change if it was exactly just one calendar year. Um, and so it might be also potentially the height in the element. Right. So these are calculated measures. These aren't, this, this is a percentage based on a calculation of what is expected based on height and weight, right? So if any of those measures are wrong, this, this could be maybe bad data. And there's a lot of technical ways for that study to be difficult as well. It's just hard to do it as, as Dr. Pesco mentioned. So there, there are tons of factors. And so I think if there's that much decline, you'd want to think about clinically what else is going on as well to see if it's a true change. Um, and I always, when I see a, sort of a, a potential outlier like that, it's always sort of, let's see what the next data point shows. Um, and it's, it's not uncommon that you see that things were changed and actually the FDC increased from that, um, from that decline. So. I think the big question is what is the actual FVC percentage value that's been, and if we're talking less than 50%, then, then BiPAP should be initiated. And then maybe another test to see if that's, that number is repeatable. I think if, if both past two studies in the past year are less than 50%, then BiPAP should be started. Yeah. Great, and if already initiated, then reviewing the pressures. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> Do anybody else have anything to add about pulmonary? Ah, here's a question. How often should we get PFTs, sleep studies? For PFTs, I do them most every visit, honestly, um, just, to, just to track, it's more data points. I think on, I would do it at least every six months. Um, for CO2 with congenital muscular dystrophy and knowing that you can hypoventilate during the day while walking, I often will get end tidal carbon dioxide levels too for most every visit. And it's it's end tidal, but the respiratory rate that goes along with it, because that can also sort of tip you off too, if you're breathing really fast, but have a like high normal carbon dioxide level. Um, and then I think was sleep studies part of it as well? Yeah, how often? So I would, so times of growth spurts are um, times where we, periods of growth spurts are periods where we usually will get a diagnostic study, even in the absence of uh, symptoms. Um, and then in addition to that, if things are changing clinically, especially from the sleep standpoint with some of those um, uh, aspects that I mentioned earlier in terms of waking up more at night, maybe more fussy during the day, taking naps again where they didn't used to. Um, those are all reasons to, to repeat another diagnostic study, make sure nothing's changed. Great. And then once, and sorry, and then once you have, uh, once you start on, on bi-level therapy, it's going to require, for most centers, it's going to require another sleep study to figure out what pressure is right. Um, and there's some modes where you don't have to, modes of ventilation where you don't necessarily have to do that, but um, it is really nice to see on a sleep study what pressure is the right pressure. Um, and then sort of in a 
similar time frame. Every couple or few years, we often will repeat a titration study to see if things have changed. The other nice thing is there are downloads from the machines that your pulmonologist can look at to see what different variables are looking like in terms of respiratory rate or mask leak, um, how many, how the percent of triggered breaths that the, the child has at nighttime. Are they triggering every breath and you want them to sort of relax so that maybe need more pressure. So there's, there's other things we can look at on a download to make tweaks here and there rather than, you know, with every move having to go to, back to the sleep lab, because that can be pretty difficult to do. And then just to clarify, we don't ne necessarily check CO2 levels for pulmonary function testing, but we should absolutely be doing that in a sleep study. Is that correct? Absolutely for a sleep study. And I, pulmonary function testing, it's something that's not routinely done, but can be done. And I am an advocate for doing it at least periodically, maybe once a year or something, you can do end title testing just to make sure. Okay, great. Okay, um, I'd like to shift over to talk about um, kind of prognosis, life ex expectancy. Um, we have a, a question about from a 34 year old who was affected, um, not in a wheelchair yet, so likely a Bethlehem type um, phenotype. What is the life expectancy and quality of life, life like with this genetic disorder? Um, you know, I have an answer for that, but I'm gonna let you guys start first. Um, Dr. Butterfield, let's, let's start with you. I, I was actually thinking you might be the most qualified to answer that question of all of us. Um, so I'll, maybe you should, but um, you know, I, I think there's a lot we know and a lot we don't know. And I think we're learning more every day and uh, even small things like uh, just knowing about respiratory care, knowing about good nutrition can really make quality of life better and length of life better. Um, and I, I don't think we know the endpoints for that right now. And it, maybe somebody else does, but I don't think we, I think it can be high quality of life for a very, very long time. Dr. Foley. I think with the data we have on, on um, proactive, how the impact of proactive pulmonary care, the data we have on how um, lifespans have been extended uh, with proactive pulmonary care, um, if, if the pulmonary care is in place and then usually the general health is quite good. And, and I mean, we have patients that are thriving 40s, 50s. Um, so I think the community itself is the best testament in terms of uh, lifespan and quality of life. And I think, um, as uh, Russ pointed out too, I mean, I think Rachel, you can speak best of all of that. So can't believe I'm saying this out loud, but I will be 51 in September. I have the intermediate phenotype, so I kind of float between the two. And um, I work full time. I went to college. I have a job. I'm married. I am doing all of the things that everybody who is unaffected is not doing. Um, and so uh, in the registry, we have a few patients who are in their 70s, um, living happy, healthy lives. Um, and like, like Dr. Foley said, maintaining really close attention on pulmonary care, nutrition, um, paying attention to changes when they occur and really connecting with your doctors to make sure that these changes are not reflecting some underlying untreated symptom, I think is is important um, and really finding um, a good healthcare team that will listen to you. Um, we as adults uh, affected individuals tend to be the best experts in our own care because there are not a whole lot of adult practitioners out there with a lot of CMD expertise. The upside to good standards of care is that we're all living longer. And I think that maybe the adult kind of care world is not necessarily, was not prepared for that. Um, and so learning everything that you can about your disease learning all of the kind of the steps to be proactive in your care and finding a care team that's willing to listen to you and learn from you and take publications from you um, really is gonna be the best way that you maintain that. Um, I, I am fortunate to have a really kind of great healthcare team that takes my lead. And if I'm feeling strange or if because of my knowledge of this disease, I know something's not right and we need to figure it out. They're happy to kind of explore that with me and not not discount me as, oh, you're a patient, I'm the doctor. So if you've got one of those, you're the patient, I'm the doctor, find another doctor. So that's my, my input on that topic. Well, um, well said. I mean, I can't add anything to that. And 
And I, I think what I said before, quality of life is such a loaded term. You know, this is uh, this is your quality of life. Yep, and it and just and for parents, if your kid's in a wheelchair, your kid's on a ventilator, or your kid has contractures, I your perspective of their life and your expectations for their life are probably not the same as what your kid's outlook is, right? They're happy, they're healthy, this is their reality. So take cues from that child or that young adult um, in terms of what they want and they need to expand their horizons and their, their quality of life. Um, and even though you're inside dying because this child is not thriving as you expected, they are thriving and they are doing everything that they want to do. And that's important. So taking the cues from that, from your, from your affected kids is, is important. Um, yeah, big, big disconnect between pediatric and adult care, hundred percent. And that's um, a lot of pediatric uh, physicians will actually allow children to stay in their care and into adulthood because um, they know there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, some institutions are a little bit more strict. And so um, that's where you really kind of want to start early um, in training your child how to self-advocate. Um, we have a really great uh, couple of videos um, in our on-demand section about transitioning um, and talking about kind of letting the child take over um, decision making um, and some of the responsibilities. Um, and it, it really, if you don't have a, a good adult program to go to, this is where it becomes critical that you become an expert in your own disease. 100% Andrea. <laughs> I think Rachel hopefully will agree with me that we now have a tool, a little plug-in that will help your help your local team feel more comfortable about knowledge about Collagen Six, and so our team has updated it to online open resource Call Six Gene Reviews. You type into Google Collagen Six and Gene Review or Collagen Six Review, yes. it pops up. You can give that link to your local team. So if they come into the room and say, "What do you have? I don't know what this is," it's all there. And a lot of physicians, I think, feel more comfortable when they see. Maybe the, the data, hopefully. I don't know what you think. Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. And I think be, because this is a pediatric condition, a lot of attention is paid to the pediatric care and studying pediatrics. But so many of the lessons learned do apply to adults. And so don't discount a paper or a publication or something online that's written by one of our experts, because it's if it's framed in, in, in the sense toward kids, it really does apply to adults as well. Yeah, it is, it is fortunately a change in landscape. I think um, the adult care teams are recognizing that more and more. And in, in, in uh, for instance, a good, good example is congenital heart disease, you know, where there was lots of care that was provided in the pediatric group and that was optimal. But when they transitioned to uh, adult uh, cardiac care where the disease spectrum is so different, um, there was a gap. And that's now being filled by um, expert groups that really take care of pediatric disease growing into adulthood. Uh, and neuromuscular, of course, um, this is just a pitch to kind of keep doing that and expanding that. It's extremely important. Yep. Right. Exactly that point Dr. Bauman just made. And um, we have on our team a wonderful adult neurologist who we've trained in congenital muscular dystrophies. And I think uh, I think you would agree too that it's it's really important that the adult neurologists get the exposure to and training in congenital muscular dystrophies. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, I wanted to briefly touch on pain. I know this is a, um, an area of concern for some um, affected individuals and their families, um, and maybe not, maybe a little bit understudied. Um, I don't know if you guys have any comments kind of around this area. Um, maybe joint pain, I think, um, back pain, I think a lot of it has to do with being more sedentary. So those kind of issues. Dr. Butterfield, did you want to start? And boy, pain is a is a difficult one to get our head around sometimes, and I think we see it at, particularly as our patients are getting older. In the pediatric side, I think it's, it's different uh, for some reason to as I got young adult and older adult patients. Um, I, I I think there's a lot of importance around addressing the causes for pain, not just treating pain. So I think there's a lot of orthopedic issues that drive pain and that if we address those and if we address them early, hopefully in ways that we don't end up with lots of pain, um, that can be helpful. Um, and I've worked with some of the pain specialists here at our institution have been very helpful in, in just helping to manage that since it's not a, a thing we do every day. Great, Dr. Halugo, did you have anything to add about that? 
I think um, I don't, uh, since I just practice pediatrics, I mean, I'm not just uh, exposed to that uh, pain and, you know, uh, fatigue so often, but uh, I think that's a major topic that must be also uh, taken into consideration. Uh, uh, for, for, for some reason, uh, for, from a, a couple of patients, uh, disproportionate to the exercise they do or some subtle changes like, you know, subtle pain or like that, uh, they, without a, a major trauma, uh, they had some uh, fractures and I just would like to link that and tie that to the also pediatric uh, bone health issues. Uh, the definitions of pediatric osteoporosis uh, is uh, for the endocrinologist is different uh, than what we understand in uh, neuromuscular diseases. So uh, how to uh, handle them uh, uh, becomes challenging uh, uh, from time to time. So uh, yes, uh, uh, we have uh, talked about the vitamin D supplementation, but I think we have to monitor uh, bone health uh, with more objective measures, uh, whole body dexas, or how we'll be doing that in uh, walkers and uh, sitters. So uh, that, that's, that, uh, I think, uh, open question for myself as well. And it's particularly relevant for the back pain issue because, you know, sometimes these silent collapse fractures of vertebral bodies can be painful and not, uh, not clearly be recognized unless you really look for them. It's important to, to do that. It's, it, a pain is multifactorial always, and, and um, in, it's important. To, so the way to look at it is, um, so the collagen-6 deficiency in itself is not painful. However, the consequences of collagen-6 deficiency can lead to condition that can be painful. Uh, so um, the collapse fractures is one example for that. Excessive contractures can be one example for that. Excessive, so well, my qualifying of, of exercise here now, if you overwork your muscles, if you overexercise, your muscle will tell you with pain, that's too much. If you overstretch, so if you have an overly aggressive stretching regimen, that can lead to tendinitis in its own right. So you can overdo that as well. Uh, if you're more active, um, so there's a, a little paradox. So if you're better from a muscle point of view, for instance, in the Bethlehem phenotype, and therefore you put more stress in, uh, on your joints because you're just physically more active, that can bring out earlier findings of osteoarthritis in these joints and lead to pain. Uh, so it all has to be looked at individualized in the context of the disease. So on the one end, you shouldn't just say, well, you have collagen 6 deficiency, therefore you have pain, uh, and so go home. Um, you have to investigate why that pain occurs in the collagen 6 deficiency. Is it related to the, fall, uh, to, to the complications of collagen 6, or is it something unrelated to collagen 6? You can have other things that are painful that have nothing to do with collagen 6. Uh, so it really deserves an investigation and not a knee-jerk reaction to that. Great. OK. <clears throat> Well, we are well over our time today, so we're going to let everybody go. Thank you so much for joining us, audience and panel. Um, if we did not get to your question, um, or if you have additional questions, please feel free to email us at scifam at qrcmd.org, and we will do our best to help you out with those questions. So thank you so much, and I hope you all have a great day. Make sure to check out everything else going on in the portal. Thank you. Thank you. I just Thank wish you. I could see everyone in the room. There. <laughs> but next year, next year we can. Right? Yes, we'll be all together next year for sure. Yeah. We missed your faces. I know it. <laughs>